right, welcome back. So today's challenge is challenge number three, but number two in the list, because we started at zero, like a true programmer. And today's challenge is called Fallout for Ethernaut. So uh, if you've not seen anything else, it's me going through a series of challenges for Ethernaut to learn more about blockchain security and embarrass myself in front of the internet. So this challenge specifically uh, was easier than I expected, but yes, I still cheated. And I had to cheat a little bit, but I learned a lot on the way, and I'm gonna teach you some of the stuff that I learned after I cheated. So if I probably just type an Ethernaut here, and spell it correctly. So use our handy dandy video series, it's already done this on our behalf, and uh, I will link this video down below. It helped me, and I'm sure it'll help you, to kind of get to the hint that I needed to figure this out. But they give you an ear saying, maybe you should just put the code in Remix. And let's take a step back. Okay, so first things first, the challenge. Our challenge here is to claim ownership. And we can see that if we just take a sneaky peeky at the statement here, where it says, I would like you to claim ownership of this contract. That's all you need to do. And then the other thing they mentioned is, as a, as a hint, the thing that might help is actually copying and pasting the source code from below here into Remix IDE. So Remix is like an IDE just on, on a browser that you can put in there. And I've done it, I've copied and pasted here, so you can see it here. In addition to that, I've also put it inside of uh, this setup here as well, so it's just easier for me to explain and it's all on a bigger screen so you can see it. All right, um, so that's the goal. Claim ownership, that's all I need to do. So what we're gonna do, as per usual, is I'm gonna walk you through the code, we're gonna find the solution, and then I'm gonna explain exactly why this happened, and I'm gonna show you a bunch of links and resources that I found useful when learning more about specifically why this is a flaw, historical attacks like this, and also a bit more about um, the element that we're exploiting. So with that being said, let's talk about the code. All right, and we talk about this all the time, but I'm gonna keep doing it so I remember. Here we have Pragma and the Pragma Solidity version. So this is our compiler version. And you can see that we're doing a floating point. So we're doing basically six and above. Remember, this is bad practice. So in production, you wanna have something that's uh, static and, and still when you put that and you deploy that contract. So it should just be uh, 0.6. In all reality, it should be a lot higher version than this. But um, if you're gonna deploy, it needs to be static and not floating. First thing. Um, next thing here is importing statements. So we've talked about this in the past. You can see that we're importing safe math specifically from Open Zeppelin. This is a common occurrence that happens a lot with a lot of contracts where they're just going to Im import both um, Open Zeppelin contracts to basically increase the security of their contract by leveraging the, the functions and the features and the methods from Open Zeppelin. But also they're going to import other contracts to build on top of those. That's the whole composability factor of blockchain and that's why a lot of people are attracted to this space. Um, so you can see that this safe math is actually being utilized right here in this state variable. And they're basically going to say that I'm going to use safe math and I'm going to use it specifically on this type of entity or this type of data type, I suppose. And that's going to help them secure that slightly. Some other items here, as you can see, we have some other state variables. So we have a mapping here. So we're mapping, we're figuring out the allocations of an address. So we can see we're having our address mapped to a UN and that's going to basically show us how many allocations has this address contributed to this contract. Additionally, we have another one here for address, and this is gonna be our owner. And this is a payable state variable, so that means that gives us the power of potentially withdrawing, as well as sending uh, ETH to, uh, to our contract. So those are our state variables. Now the next thing here is really the exploitable piece. So we will get to this. We're gonna skip it and go to the everything else, but keep in mind, check mark, this is what we care about. Um, and one thing I'll point out is that this is a constructor, but this is not necessarily the constructor that you and I are used to seeing, at least if you've looked at um, contracts that are like seven and up, basically, or things six and up or something like that, when you're looking at contracts and constructors. Just keep that in your head. We're gonna keep going. We'll come back to that, I promise. Um, so next thing here is we can see we have a modifier. So this is a common modifier that we've come across quite frequently, and that's the only owner uh, modifier that's specifically utilized to ensure that you're putting access controls and the functions that you don't necessarily want somebody to utilize if they're not the owner of the contract. So this is a simple access controls method. And here we're basically saying, okay, we want to require that um, the sender uh, is the owner. So that's the first thing. And if they're not, then they're going to say, you know, caller is not owner. And we're going to basically place this modifier specifically on top of this function down here. And 
this specific function, you can see by the name, is going to basically siphon off all the allocations that have been contributed to this contract. And what we're going to do is here, we're going to say the sender, we want to transfer um, this contract's balance to this address. Now that's basically what that's trying to protect is making sure that only the owner can do that piece. Next thing here is we have allocate. So this is just a common uh, function you can basically call and allocate to the contract. So we can say, okay, the sender is going to um, basically allocate a certain amount of value inside of their allocations. So that's when they're going to then get that mapping. So the mapping up top of the contract where we had the mapping of the address and the allocations, when you allocate, that's going to add you to that mapping and then you can keep adding allocations to that with your address. Another thing here is we have send allocations. So this is basically saying we want to send allocations from one allocator to another. So say I've allocated, so this is B, A, and let's make sure I'm reading this correctly. Require that the allocator is greater than zero, and then I want you to transfer the allocator's allocations to this allocator. Yeah, okay. So we have A and B, right? So let's say that A is allocated one ETH, B is allocated two, and at this point in time, maybe we want to actually take the allocations that one has allocated and send it over to B to make theirs three. And that's basically what's being stated here. We're saying, okay, A is going to be the allocator that we're putting into this variable here. I think payable, maybe? I don't know. I think I think is what we're trying to do here. So that's what's happening there. We'll, we'll just, just go to the next thing. All right. Uh, we talked about this. And last one here is um, allocator balance. So this is checking the balance of your address. So you would basically say, I want to get the balance of my allocations I've made. This is a public view return function. So remember view uh, costs no money. So costs no ETH. So because we're reading, we're not writing. So this is a read function. And what we're going to do is we're going to have our allocator address. And we're going to ask for allocations. That's going to return us back to us. So those are some of the functions and the pieces inside of this. So let's go back to the beginning and look at the area that we're actually going to exploit. Now remember, the challenge here is basically to become the owner. And specifically inside of this constructor, we can see right away that the owner is going to be established whoever sends. So the sender is the owner. We're going to, we're going to add that here. In addition to that, we're going to basically say um, the value for the owner. So we want to make sure that uh, we can derive the value that this owner has provided via allocations. But the most important piece is here. Now, something I didn't see, and you may have not seen in this video or the other video you've watched has helped you figure that out. But the old school of writing constructors and constructors, I think, um, I forgot the version of it, but I have, I have some notes here and a bunch of links that I want to share with you. Let's, uh, I think one of these links will tell us specifically, oops, the specific version. supported function having the same new okay 4.2 so you can see it here um, it states that 4.2 was when they stopped utilizing this type of method of creating constructors and historically what would happen with constructors is you would basically identically name the constructor name after the contract because we can see this is named fallout and this is named fallout and you can see that this function is the very first function that occurs even before the modifier so we know that this is going to be our constructor. So a constructor specifically is something that initializes state for a contract. And I have a link here that's actually quite useful and it explains kind of what a constructor is, why it's utilized and how it works. And they also give some examples of different types of constructors and how inheritance works through constructors. But like I said, the main thing that you need to understand here and really concern yourself with is this little bit of information here. At the very top, they basically state that the purpose of this is to initialize the state of the contract. And that's kind of how that functions there. Uh, we give one really important, important example here, and it's in our contract as well, is if we go down here, uh, let me find it. Okay, so it's basically here explaining the need for constructors. Why do constructors exist? Well, it tries to give you one clear example of how this is utilized. So they have their constructor here where they're explaining this, and you can see that they're basically uh, assigning the owner to the sender. And this is just a great way to um, establish a contract's owner when you deploy it to the, to the mainnet, to the production, ensuring that there's no hokey pokey where there shouldn't be when it comes to the owner of the contract. Now, like I said, that example I just showed you had, a, had the word constructor. And I think it was like 4.2 or whatever I just showed you, a pass. They started using the term constructor instead of 
basically I using the the title of the contract and the function as that method because this was the old method of saying okay fallout fallout we know this is the constructor because it's called fallout and the contract's called fallout so this is the constructor um, that's faulty reason being is that here if you look at this this uh, constructor this fallout this fallout um, term it actually doesn't say fallout you can see that these two here look slightly different this is an L and this is a one and if we look at it closer we can see okay that's an L and that is definitely not an L that's a one now when this happens and you incorrectly name your constructor and it doesn't match the contract it's no longer a constructor it's just a regular function so this is a regular function that's public to everybody to see and it's payable so anybody that calls this function that has access to this contract can become the owner and if they can become the owner then we know that they can come down here and they can collect the allocations which is no bueno but we don't really care about that right now because all our goal is to basically just take ownership so with that being said i'm going to jump back here and we know the flaw now so if we just go back to our contract here and we go to our handy dandy terminal inside of the uh, inside of the thingy here uh, I want to make sure that I'm setting this up right so let's do contract owner so we can see the owner currently is a bunch of zeros that's the owner and if we look at ourself uh, player maybe there's no need for that maybe it's because I have two spaces maybe you don't need to await anything all right so you can see that this is us and we are not the owner. And we can validate that by going to our MetaMask and you can see the, the address here is the same. Now, really, all we should have to do is just call that function. And I just wanna show you here in the ABI, the functions that are accessible, because we've gone to the API, we've, we've learned about this ABI, not API. And we can see these different items. So we have our functions here, how they, how they work, how they're set up, what they're expecting, things like that. So if we just do contract fallout and we confirm that transaction to the sender we want to send it to fall we'll call it fall if we can if we can spell fall all right and this is going to process and hopefully it'll work correctly for me first time all right so as that's loading i'm going to show you some links that I found useful. So I've already shown you the constructor one, it explains the constructor, its purpose, all that stuff. Remember, it's just around the initializing state, that's the main purpose for it. Um, interestingly enough, reading these documents actually helped quite a bit. So Security in the Bootcamp series has a massive uh, substack series if you're interested in more about uh, smart, con smart contract security and auditing them. Um, I recommend reading this and kind of working through the content there. Additionally, Mastering Ethereum is another kind of viable piece that a lot of people recommend, and that was useful as well. Both of which, actually, I've read, and inside of reading those, um, they both talked about this problem. I vaguely remembered this concept once I kind of saw the hint and things like that, and I realized that this is the issue. Um, but I've linked them both here, so you could actually see that, and you can see it inside of the YouTube the description below. But inside of here, if we do constructor, you can see they've referenced it here. So remember, 4.2 and above has been fixed and they're basically talking about that flaw and how it's exploited. Same thing applies for Mastering Ethereum. We'll link directly to that section and it talks you through that problem. And um, there's actually a, uh, a SWC 118, which is basically a, it's a repo of vulnerabilities associated to contracts and solidity. And you can see them talking about the same thing. I'll link that below as well. They all talk about the same stuff. It's very repetitive. They all copy each other. I'm pretty sure, I'm, I don't really remember the origins of who started it, but they're all copying basically the same content. Um, here's a detector inside of Slither that would detect this if we ran it over top of the contract. That's also useful to kind of look through and see how Slither would detect this and its method of doing so. Um, another thing I'll share is this resources which kind of kicked off this entire thing. I came across this resource trying to figure out specifically what is this vulnerability, what is it called, and how, how is it known, how was it exploited in the past. Um, that led me to this specific resource which I've saved and I'm going to read because it's definitely super useful. If you look at the top it's basically um, a huge summary of many of the different security flaws. It might be slightly outdated, um, but you know, it's definitely worth uh, taking a look at. So, and here you saw, I think it was 13. And inside of this, if you read this, it basically points you out, actually it says the Ethernet challenge shows up this flaw. 
It talks through the flaw here, uh, how it's weakness and things like that. But most importantly, I wanted to show you a real life example of how this was exploited back in, I think, 2018, maybe. But it was uh, this blockchain here, uh, Rubixi. And Rubixi utilized a constructor that was misnamed on accident. Reason being is that they actually changed the name of the, the group. So it, it was originally called Dynamic Pyramid. Uh, you can see it here. And they changed the contract name uh, to Rubixi. And when they changed the contract name, they forgot to actually change the first function, aka the constructor, to fit the new name. So it was still it was still named Dynamic Period uh, uh, Pyramid when it when it was changed to Rubixi. And you can see that actually in the contract code, which is one of the coolest parts of like this whole blockchain concept is you can actually go back in time and see the code that was deployed, why it was flawed, and all that stuff. And if we go down here and open this up, maybe we can zoom in so you can see it better. A little bit more. So if you look here inside of the contract, we can see that the contract here is labeled Rubixi, right? And then we have our state variables. Uh, we have an address, which is another state variable. And then right here, we have our constructor. And we have our modifier and everything else below that. But specifically here, you can see that this constructor is named Dynamic Pyramid. And it allows the sender to become the creator. And if, the creators, if you become the creator, that means you can siphon off a lot of the funds in the context of this contract. So they misnamed the constructor. And then once this occurred, there was a whole you know, kerfuffle and everybody freaked out. And that's when they made that update from I think 4.12 or something. And they included the term constructor instead of just naming the constructor the same as the contract. So I'll link all that stuff below and I'll share all that information with you so you can kind of read it yourself and do the, do the hard work and due diligence on your own. But here we can see that we've submitted the transaction. And if we go to the test net, we can see it's a success, which is great. And that means if we do an await uh, contract owner, we can see that we are the owner. So if we submit this instance and wait a little bit, we will be gifted with a reward. Level completed. Oh, yeah. And here you can see they actually talk through the specific uh, example I've just told you. So in here they touch on all these items and... I actually didn't complete the challenge to know that they showed me this, so I did all the research prior to finding this out, but it was still useful. And you can see basically they talked through all the stuff I mentioned of how they changed the contract name from Dynamic Pyramid to Rubixi and how that messed up the constructor and how that basically um, allowed people to become the, uh, the owner or the, in the actual real code, it's not called the owner, it's called the collector or whatever, whatever it was called. Uh, but yeah, so there you go. That is Fallout and I will see you on CoinFlip.